Well, good morning to all of you again. We start this second installment of our series on biblical parenting. Pastor Mike already read the passage from Ephesians chapter 4, but to begin with this morning, turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is addressing an entirely different congregation, obviously, but writes some of the same instruction to, as we will see in a little while, to groups of subordinates and superiors. And he comes to this verse in chapter 3, verse 21, and writes these words, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So with these two passages of Scripture in mind, these will be those uh, watershed passages that we'll be considering together this morning as we consider this awesome task of bringing up little ones in our homes. Let's pray and ask God's help on our time together this morning and that He would help us to understand His Word. Father, we do come again and ask that you would send your spirit, who is the one who would take the things of Christ, bring them to your people, instructing us, teaching us, giving light where we are inherently and naturally in darkness, to help us to understand, to know the way that you would have us to walk and how you would have us to behave in all dimensions of our lives. And in particular this morning, as we approach your word on this matter of being fathers and mothers to our children, you would help us, Lord, to see where we need correction. Bring that instruction to bear on our own consciences and change whatever is amiss in our own lives. We ask this that we may be true salt and light in this evil and perverse generation. By our behavior, showing what the good and wise will of our God is, in this matter in particular, help us to resist the pressure being applied by our own culture and society that goes counter to what you have said. We ask this help in Jesus' name. Amen. So the two New Testament passages which serve together as the watershed for biblical parenting, instruction, and molding of our children's character are these two passages written by the Apostle Paul to the congregations of Ephesus and of Colossae. And he writes these words to them, and contained in these passages uh, is the instruction for us parents on how to undertake the enormous responsibility of molding the character of our children. And the words in these verses are very brief, but they are rich in their meaning, and they serve as, it were, rivers flowing out into other portions of Scripture, which we will look at in the coming installments of this series to help us in this task, to give us a God-like understanding, an understanding of what God's mind is with regards to our task and responsibility as moms and dads. So first, we come, I'll begin here in Colossians passage, and we will move back and forth between this passage and the one in Ephesians chapter 6. But to begin with, we start here, and my first point, and by the way, if you hadn't gotten one, there are on the back, and I will endeavor to provide these every time we do one of these installments, an outline of this morning's sermon. And the first point in today's sermon is fathers, front and center. So moms, you can sort of listen on the edges of the field while dads are now standing on the 50-yard line in the center of the field, and they're the ones being addressed by the Apostle Paul in this passage. And you fathers, he says here in Colossians 3.21. 
It's a fixed principle with the apostle. Imagine him sitting there wherever he was when he was writing these letters, one to the Ephesians, and then sometime on a different occasion, writing one to the Colossians. And when he gets to that portion of his letter where he's addressing family matters, he uses the same term, the same word, when he gets to this point in his letter. It's a fixed principle in the mind of the apostle. It's a fixed principle in the mind of the Holy Spirit. Even more to the point. That when he writes to those congregations, he writes using this same word when coming to this portion of his instruction. And it's important to note here that he didn't just write this word here randomly. He didn't just use the word fathers when what he really meant was parents. As if he forgot what the word for parents was when he came to this point in his letter. But look with me at the immediate context here in Colossians chapter 3. In the immediate context, domestic and economic relationships are being addressed beginning at verse 18 of chapter 3 and running all the way through until the first part of chapter 4. And in all, the apostle addresses three sets of couplets. The first couplet, verses 18 and 19. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Couplet number one, wives, husbands. Couplet number two, chapter three, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Couplet number two. Now he comes to couplet number three. Bondservants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of that inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, And there is no partiality. Then he addresses masters in chapter 4 and verse 1. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing you also have a master in heaven. You see these couplets he's writing to. First he addresses the subordinate. Then he addresses the superior in that couplet. Wives, husbands, children, Parents, specifically father, and then servants and their masters. And in this very immediate context, he writes in verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And then rather than addressing the superior in that relationship, in that couplet, rather than saying, and parents, do not provoke your children, he says specifically, and you fathers. So he hasn't forgotten the word for parent, he just used it. But now, when he turns to address the superior side of that equation, After having spoken to the children, now he turns his address and he's looking at mom and dad. And who's he talking to? Straight to the dad. He's looking him in the eye and saying, and you fathers, do not provoke your children. Of interest here is that when speaking to the children, he uses the term that they should obey Both their parents, that is, from the child's point of view, when father and mother are being, their father and mother are to be obeyed. But then, 
When speaking to the other side of the couplet of the equation in this family relationship, he specifically names the dads and lays upon them the responsibility of the instruction of their children. Now, this does not mean, however, that he alone is to do the training and the admonition, and that the mother has no role in this. Paul has already written to the children in this relationship that they are to obey whom? Parents. Again, from their perspective, when they're thinking of who it is they should have their obedience directed to, it is to both dad and mom. And so there is no thinking in the apostle's mind here that it is only the dads that the children must obey, and therefore it is not only the dad who has a part in giving them the instruction and the admonition. So the mother is involved in this task as well as the father, and she does bear responsibility to her for her faithfulness but she does not bear the same responsibility as her husband, as the father in the family. Now, of course, this does not mean that the mother has no role or even a minimal role in raising children. Generally speaking, the mother will spend more time with the children. She is the one who is there, particularly in our culture, in the way that uh, it is most often arranged that men are working outside the home and it necessitates their leaving the home early in the morning most times and headed to the office or the factory or whatever work environment they head to. And mom is there during the day to see the children, get them up, get them ready, feed them breakfast. And in cases where homeschooling is not being done and they send off to a school of whatever kind they go to, whether public or private, She's the one who's doing that, helping them to get ready and send them off. Generally speaking, that is the case. She is the one who will spend much of the time, probably majority of the time, with the children in the home. But the ultimate responsibility before God falls on the Father. He must as head of the home, not only be involved, but set the tone in his home and give the instruction and lay down the expectations and enforce the standards and especially be the teacher and the disciplinarian of his children. You, Father, must not put all of this on the shoulders of your wives simply because they may, in the arrangement of things, be the ones who spend the majority of the time with the children. It is still your responsibility, and one that cannot be given over, abrogated, or pretended as though it really isn't your deal. You, Father, must not put all of this on your wife. You must not leave it to the school. You must not leave it to the church. It isn't a responsibility that the Holy Spirit has given to pastors to instruct your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We have our responsibility as pastors to instruct the church in general. And there will be times when we are instructing in such a way that we will give specific applications to both moms and dads like I'm doing right now and there will be times when we will give specific applications even to children in the congregation just as the apostle Paul here just did and children you can imagine there in Ephesus as soon as that word was spoken when the letter was being written that little ones throughout the congregations their ears pricked up all these things the pastor is reading from this apostle Paul, and suddenly he has something to say to us, we little ones? Well, there will be times when that comes from the pulpit. But the 
specific responsibility of instructing children in, is in the home, and even in that context, the specific responsibility is to be borne by fathers. This is your responsibility. And so says the Holy Spirit. And this is a very important message for young fathers because of how many other things will demand your time and take you away from your family. We do not anymore live in a primarily agricultural society and culture where fathers and children many times work together in the fields and in the barn. But nowadays, as I mentioned earlier, fathers are many times outside the home pursuing careers, long hours away from home, in the office and in the work environment. Or perhaps we have a number of recreational activities that take us away also. Hunting, golfing, fishing, vacations of one kind or another, conferences that need to be gone to, and various other legitimate avocations that take us away from being with our children. Or maybe it's even church work or work related to the Christian school, if there is that kind of work here in this congregation. It takes you away from families that necessitates your attention. Whatever those things are, one thing we must remember and must remain clear in our own thinking is that none of those vocations or those avocations are an exemption from this God-given duty that is laid on fathers here to raise your children. A father's high priority and calling from God is to bring up his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So fathers, fathers-to-be, Examine your hearts, examine your priorities, and seek to order them according to God's word. How can I so arrange things that I can be right on top of this duty and make sure that I am abiding by the word of God and, and ordering my home in such a way that it is clear that I am the one who is setting the tone and the expectations, and giving the direction, and instructing my children, and very much engaged in this duty. You see, being a father is much more than simply having a physical connection to your children. Or a Christian, Fatherhood is recognizing the kind of father that God is to us and patterning, patterning ourselves after that. And as our Heavenly Father, God provides for our needs, both physical and spiritual. He instructs His children. He disciplines His children. He hears the prayers of His children. He never abandons or forgets His children or treats them as unimportant, or even worse, treats them as botherances or nuances. What's the word I'm looking for? Nuisances. He doesn't treat his children this way. And we would seek as believers and followers of our Lord, we would seek to be fathers like him to our own children. You know God is your father. You will want to be that kind of father to your children. Well, why spend so much time on this point? Paul only wrote two words. You, fathers. And so far I have spent 15 minutes on two words. Why so? In these two words, 
is packed a biblical principle about the role of a man as father. It has its roots in the very creation of the first man, Adam. He is the head of his house, his home. To understand the biblical principle and to implement it in your homes is to be swimming against the current of the philosophy of our society who largely discounts and even vandalizes and criminalizes the role of a man in his own home. As if everything, as if everything that is wrong with a home is the man's fault. Therefore, he should be removed from the environment. It's alarming how many times a man in the home is portrayed as the buffoon, the unnecessary participant in our culture. And in order to embrace what the Holy Spirit has given here in his word by saying right directly to us as men in our homes, as fathers, in order to embrace that and to walk according to that, we definitely will be swimming against the current of current culture and society. And if it is not taught, if this is not taught, then fathers will get their cues for parenting elsewhere, both good and bad. You will learn how to be a dad from somewhere. Remember what I said last week. From day one, teaching your children is a responsibility. And whether you do it actively or choose to passively participate, either way, what are you doing? Teaching. Teaching them something. And in the same way, we as fathers are going to learn. How many times have we, my wife and I have often said this, I'm sure, over the years, would that there were an instruction manual, something I could follow, turn to the table of contents and see, hmm, what do I do in this case? Look what she's doing over there. How do I deal with that? There's got to be something here in the glossary that tells me how to go about dealing with this as a dad, as a mom. Pray for wisdom and we ask for help and we come back to the word of God and he says, here's what you should do. Here's what you should not do. Here's our instruction. Here's our manual, if you will. But we will learn from somewhere. We will pick up books sometimes in desperation, saying, what do I do when I've got a child who acts like this or whose character is like that? How do I handle them? What do I do as a mom or a dad? And we must begin with what God says, or we may pick up practices and habits that are not godly, and the fruit of those things will be born in years to come. So, fathers, front and center. Second point in our sermon, in my sermon this morning, subdue the will, don't break the spirit. And where do I get this from these passages, both here in Colossians and in Ephesians? Subdue the will, don't break the spirit. When addressing the relationship between superiors and subordinates in this passage, everywhere but here, the apostle uses positive admonitions. Look again at verse 18 here in Colossians chapter 3. Positive admonition. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Another way of saying it is this. Wives do submit. Positive. Chapter 19, verse 19. Husbands do love your wives. Positive admonition. Children do obey your parents. Positive admonition. But now when he comes to dads, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children. 
When addressing the relationship between the superiors and the subordinates in this passage, everywhere but here, the apostle uses positive admonitions to wives, to husbands, to children. But where here, where he addresses fathers with regards to their children, the apostle begins with a negative admonition. And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath. wrath. He says the same thing in Corinthians. Or actually, not Corinthians, in Ephesians. Here in Colossians, by the way, he says simply, do not provoke your children. But in Ephesians, it's if he opens that up a little further and says to them, and you fathers, verse 4, do not provoke your children to wrath. Either way, He admonishes them in a negative way not to provoke their children. Now, when I did this series in Sunday school, we had at this point broken for a bit of a discussion. What were some of those behaviors that can provoke our children to the point of wrath, of provoking them to Something called wrath in this passage. The word here, by the way, don't provoke them to wrath, indicates a disheartening, a dispiriting. Something has happened. And this is what the apostles is admonishing dads not to go there with any of their children, is that when you're dealing with your children, make sure that this one thing you avoid Do not dishearten your children. Do not bring them to a point where they are so discouraged that they don't want to do anything. And this is why I say at this point that we are to subdue the will, which will become very apparent in this series, Along the way, in doing that, of molding character and subduing the will of our children, one thing that we are to guard and to avoid, guard against and to avoid, is the breaking of the spirit of the child, of discouraging them, of of provoking them to wrath. And when we had that discussion among ourselves back then as a Sunday school class, Some of the ideas that came out were a lack of judicious, individualized application of principles. Dealing with every single child of yours in the exact same way, in spite of the fact that they are different in their personalities, in their perceptions, in their characters, and then there is, and because of that, there is some wisdom. There is wisdom in saying, I need to deal with this one differently than the way I deal with that one, because if I deal with them both the same, I am going to provoke one or the other of them. And you know from your own experiences, those of you who have now grown children, And those of you who are in the midst of bringing up little ones, you know that to address one is not the same as addressing the other. One of them you may say across the dinner table, they say something out of place, and you may look at them and go, and immediately they melt, they know they've done something inappropriate, and inside, at least internally, They've become sorry for what they've done. And all you had to do was in point. They know that was all that was needed from dad or from mom. And on the other side of the table, you may have one that does the same kind of thing. And you may go, and she may look at you and go. (laughs) Now, those are two very different kind of children with very different kinds of boldness and courage and of will. And one is easily conformed in a way that was just, in a way that was wise and kind and gentle from dad when he simply snapped his fingers and pointed. And it was enough to melt the child's heart 
into a proper compliance. Whereas the other one was like, hey, back at you. And now you need to take further methods. This is what we call escalation. And we may have to leave the dinner table for a few minutes and go into another room. What if we dealt with both children the same way? And every time one of them did anything amiss, even knowing there's one with a gentle spirit, but both of them are going to get the same kind of treatment. And because I know that only one kind of treatment works for daughter number two, I'm going to treat daughter number one the same way, just out of fairness, so-called. Inappropriate. It is not needed. It is not wise. And it will break the spirit of child number one. Her will didn't need that. So a lack of judicious, individualized application. And if you're anything like me, the question in your own mind right now is, well, how do we know? And all I can say to you is do what I have done, what my wife and I have endeavored to do. Pray to God for wisdom. And look at his word and see, here are the principles. Now, how do I apply them? There isn't any instruction manual. God would have us dependent upon him. Go to him. Plead to him. Confess your lack of personal wisdom in some given situation. And ask for him to give the wisdom that you need. But be dependent upon him. What are some other of those behaviors that provoke? And I'll just rapidly go down the list that I have here in my notes. Lack of forgiveness leads to alienation and irritation perpetuates the problem. Child comes to you and says, I'm sorry. Well, okay, we'll see how it goes. Well, try to do better next time rather than embracing the child and say to them freely and fully forgiven. Let's pray together that you'll be able to do better next time. Failure to commend your child for sincere effort and improvement. Didn't quite get there, didn't quite do it well, but there was a sincere effort and there was improvement. And you said not a word to encourage. think they notice they do notice they do remember failure to recognize real limits of ability lack of domestic piety simply taking them to church but no genuine piety at home and interpreting all of life by God's word at some point they're going to make a judgment and say if it's only going to church. That's not what I want. This is an outgrowth, a consistent desire to be under the faithful ministry of God's word and ministers is an outgrowth of what they already know from home. We read, we read the passage last week from Deuteronomy. You have these things in your own heart and then speak to them with your children when you rise up, when you lie down, when you're walking in the way, not just when you come to church. And even then, it's somebody else doing the talking, not you. Where is your speaking to them? Another one, accentuating the negative. Always bringing up what is wrong instead of acknowledging what is right. Lack of transparency. Acknowledging your own weakness with your children and confessing your own sins to them and seeking their forgiveness. Withholding corporal punishment. Withholding spankings when needed. It provokes a child to anger. Cruel speech is another. 
inadequate or inconsistent verbal admonition. Communication, communication, communication. We learned a very important lesson as elders, how very important communication is. Didn't we, Dan, Mike? Pastor Mark would say yes too if he were here this morning. They're very clear sometimes and other times not so clear and people begin to wonder, well, what's going on? Well, our kids are like this. Does dad really love me? I will never forget how one pastor recounted as teaching these same principles at a family conference and one evening admonishing the dads, speaking this very thing that we're talking about this morning, admonishing the dads, if you have never given appropriate indications, both physically and verbally, of affection to your children, you have some repenting to do, and you need to do it tonight when you go back to your rooms. He remembers the next day walking out on the ball field or something when there was family time and game time during the conference, and one of these teenage boys came popping along the trail, smiles and just giddy, and he said, I wanted to tell you that this morning my dad came to me and for the first time in my life told me he loved me because he took to heart what you said to him last night from the pulpit. A teenager, having never heard those words from his dad. His dad, I don't think, meant anything ill by it. Just assume that because I work hard, I bring home the paycheck, I provide a house and food and clothing and a comfortable bed, my children just as ordinarily and naturally know that I love them. No, they do not. They need to hear it from you. There needs to be an adequate and consistent verbal, verbal and physical display and communication of genuine affection and approval to our children. And every chance I get, even did it yesterday, holding one of my grandkids in my arm because her little legs were tired as we walked around an orchard. And I was holding her, and I just leaned over to her, and I said, you know what? And she looked at me and said, what? I said, Grandpa loves you. I don't know if that's going to make any large impression for long term, but I suspect that's going to find a place somewhere in here. Well, dads, you take those opportunities. It means an awful lot to a little impressionable mind and heart. And if we withhold these things, that also leaves an impression on a little impressionable mind and heart. But not a good one. Colossians 3.21 sheds a little light on this. Do not provoke them, lest they become discouraged. And there's that word, discouraged, disheartened. No more heart in it. No more spirit in it. Being the child of this particular dad is hard. In the child's mind, it's hard. I don't know if dad approves. I don't know if Dad or mom, love me. I'm not sure. There's nothing that I can do that's good enough for dad. So how could I never know a God who could ever commend me? If dad can't, how could God? I'm not sure if mom loves me. How could I ever know anything about a loving God? We are to avoid patterns of behavior that will provoke our children to anger because they will become discouraged, disheartened, 
dispirited. And that's the meaning of the word here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. In all that we do as fathers and mothers, we are to be engaged in the work of counteracting the poison in their hearts. Yes, but we are also to be spurring them on and encouraging them toward God, onward to God and to faith and to truth and to good works. To be provoking them to anger by our bad behavior will cause them to want to give up in this pursuit. And they will think, What's the use? What's the use? And I would make one careful distinction here for you dads. Here's some wisdom that we need to remember. Because this is also another impression trying to be stamped upon us by culture today. One careful distinction must be mentioned here. We are not to provoke our children to wrath so as to dishearten them. True. But this does not mean that we are to strive to have peace in our homes at any cost. And I'll expound that a little before we move on to our final point. There is still a very real corruption in the hearts of our children. There is a resistance there, as I mentioned last week, that poison that's there that's trying to bring them down. And it is our job, our responsibility, to counteract that corruption and that poison, that original sin that is there. That's our role. Point them to truth. Point them to God. Teach them of repentance and the gospel and sin and of redemption. But along the way, even doing the right things as a dad, you're going to find that your children will be angry with you. Now, there's a kind of anger that comes from our provoking them. That's the kind we are not to do. There is also the possibility and very much the likelihood that in doing what is exactly right, one or other or all of your children are not going to receive it willingly. They are going to resist it. And you're going to find even anger coming out saying, I will not have that, even though that is not your rule. It is God's rule. There will be anger. There will be strife. Our Lord even said that his coming into the world, even down to the family level, can bring a sword, strife, and division. But we are to move through that and stay faithful and stay consistently on the ground of truth and not give it up simply to have peace in our homes. So while we are working at making sure that we ourselves are not bringing strife because of our bad and unrighteous behavior and words as dads, we also need to be wise enough to distinguish that this strife, this thing that I'm dealing with right now is not my making. If there's anyone with whom my child has a controversy right now because of what I'm seeking to enforce in my home, their controversy is with God, ultimately, not with me. And as a faithful follower of God, I must enforce this truth, this principle in my home. And when my children are angry because of it, I must not give up on truth. Again, you say, then what will I do? You will work through the strife. You will stand your ground. Because what you're now working on is not the spirit of the child only, but the will of the child. There is only one will that can win that contest. And you, dads, must determine that it is going to be the will of God. He has said, little Billy, little Susie, 
God has said, and this is what we will do. I don't like that. Your controversy is with God, not with Daddy. And Daddy must stick to what God has said. You see, even that conversation is going to have a positive impact. They will see why Dad's doing what Dad's doing. Dad's not just being arbitrary. Dad's not just being capricious. Dad's following somebody. And that's the convincing that we need to bring to our homes. There's still that corruption in the hearts of our children that we must be earnestly counteracting. There is a very real contest involving two wills that are in conflict and in which one will must prevail. This is implied in the positive admonition that follows the negative one. Back there in Ephesians now, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, which we'll start on our next installments of the series. He not only gives that negative admonition to fathers in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but... Now he puts there a positive admonition. But bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This brings me to my final point in this morning's sermon, which is teach me while my heart is tender. The negative admonition is joined by that positive one, as I just pointed out here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. There is something we are not to do as fathers in this work of rearing our children, but there is a counterpart that we are to be doing. Something we are to avoid and something that we are to embrace. And the word is translated variously <coughs> in this way. And the word I'm concentrating on right now is the word in my translation, which says, bring them up. Now, in English, it's three words, bring them up. But in the Greek language, it is simply one word. And it's often translated like this, bring them up. Sometimes it's translated, nurture them. Other times it's translated, nourish them. This is our positive admonition. The meaning is to bring the child to a point of maturity. That's what we're doing when we nourish something, when we nurture something. When we watched, or saw rather, we didn't watch them grow, but when we saw the results of these apple trees in the orchard yesterday having grown into maturity, and there was all manner of fruit hanging on their branches of all different varieties, and it's really amazing as we talked over on our way home, we stopped at a booth and talked to a gentleman who was starting his own orchard and he was describing for us how he had to acquire some rootstock which grew in a certain way that was developed at Cornell University and he would graft in various varieties of apple flavors, varieties I guess is the right word, Cortland, Honeycrisp, Macintosh, etc., but all on this same rootstock. But when he began with that rootstock, it wasn't immediately a tree growing apples. It needed his help as a farmer to do this exact thing, to nurture it, to watch over it, to feed it, to protect it, to do all of those things that were necessary to bring it to the point where someday visitors to his orchards could ride out to that part of the orchard on the wagons and jump off with their bags and pick fruit from the tree and fill their bags and go back home. This is what we're doing with our children. Nurturing them. Bringing them up to a point of maturity. And a few passages of Scripture to leave you with this morning. From Genesis chapter 18. God, speaking of Abraham, for I have known him. 
in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And then from Deuteronomy chapter 6, familiar passage, we read it last week together. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. From Psalm 78 and verse 4, we will not hide them from our children. Telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. And then Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And finally, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul writing and speaking of Timothy, that from a childhood, from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The fathers whom I've called front and center here this morning, men of all ages, whether you are now granddads, as I am, or fathers, fathers-to-be, take these things to heart. My closing admonition would be to you younger ones, first of all. Take these things to heart, and where you are implementing them already in your homes, keep up the good work. Keep up. Don't let it slide. Don't let it become weak. But resolve to shore up around that activity of bringing up your children, of taking that weight upon your own shoulders and setting the tone in your homes. Keep up the good work. You young men who are not yet dads, who desire to be someday, embrace these things now. It is not unimportant because you are not yet there in that chapter of your life. Now is the time to make this a settled principle in your own mind and in your own walk. And always remember that story of Daniel that we read in the scriptures when he got to Babylon and was forced into a situation where he was being asked to do something that was against his conscience and his practice that he had, quote, already determined in his heart that he would behave himself in a certain way regardless of what he was being asked to do or forced to do. He would simply take the consequences as they came. And when he was being given that food which was patently against his dietary restrictions and behavior under the law of Moses, he resisted because he had already determined in his heart ahead of time what he would do. Be like Daniel. Do not wait until fatherhood comes upon you and you're driving home from the hospital with your wife and a little one in the seat in the back and going, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do first? already have decided there are certain things you will not allow to be jettisoned from your family and your home. These principles must stick and stay and be guarded. And then to those of us who are older, your children are grown, grown, they've left home long ago or maybe not so long ago. And you recognize there are some things I did not do well. I did not. And you've got fuel for repentance and a reason to call up even your grown children and say to them, I was not a godlike dad. Here's what I'm confessing. 
and ask their forgiveness. Who knows? But will God use that very thing to bring some wayward adult child back into a path of obedience to God? We don't know what God might do. I told you when we began the series, there'd be something for all of us. And I hope that you'll take what I've said this morning to heart. That God may be honored in all our behavior in this world. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we do ask that you would bring us to a point of always depending on you. I pray especially for dads of young families who are here in this congregation. We thank you for the many children that you have blessed them with and ask that you would give them that grace to hear your word and to look at what we have considered this morning and to then go and examine their own homes and their own behaviors and determine to walk according to your word. Give them grace. Give them that kind of determination that comes from above to lead their children to nurture them, to bring them up, to form their characters and not allow the world to be the ones forming their character. I pray that you give them wisdom to counteract the corruption that is there, that is a result of the fall. Give them a spirit of utter dependence upon you for wisdom. In all these things, we pray, Father, help us as a congregation to walk in a way that is honoring to you in an evil and a perverse generation, that we may be true salt and light in the sight of all of those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.